Okay, let's uh, take a look at some uh, flight safety and emergency procedure things that you need to know about for the exams and that you need to know about for your everyday practice. Okay, when we talk about safety, the first thing that we should probably talk about real quick is, uh, is uh, who actually governs aviation. If you're already in a flying role, I know this is going to be very remedial to you. But remember that all of our aviation practices are actually governed by the federal government. It's a, it's a department responsible for that is the FAA or the Federal Aviation Administration. And they're responsible for governing everything that has to do with pilots, with maintenance on aircraft, with the aircraft themselves, and with the, uh, with the actual uh, airways, if you will, or, 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 the, uh, or um, the, uh, the, the places where we fly, the, the altitudes that we fly at, and uh, controlled airspace and all that good stuff. Now, for us in Air Medical, there are two big parts of their regulations that we really, really care about. Their regulations are called the FARs, which are Federal Aviation Regulations. Uh, the FAA writes the FARs, and the FARs are the Bible, if you will, that our pilots are responsible for uh, for following. When we talk about the, the two parts that are the most important to us in Air Medical, the first part is Part 91. Part 91 is general aviation. So pretty much if you operate an aircraft in this country, then you are responsible for meeting the Part 91 requirements. And so some examples of Part 91 requirements would be things like E2H and drugs. Like in the Part 91 requirements, it says that no pilot or crew member uh, can, uh, can operate in an aircraft if they've had alcohol to drink within the last eight hours, or if their BAC is uh, greater than 0 0.04, or if they've got any drugs or medications on board that would inhibit their ability to make decisions and do their job safely. Uh, another good example of something that's in Part 91 is child restraint. The FARs state that uh, whenever you are transporting a child, that child, if they are less than two years old, they can sit in a parent's lap. If they are not less than uh, two years old, in other words, if they're two or older, then, uh, then um, that child needs to be in their own independent seat and they need to be appropriately secured, i.e. like in a car seat. So again, that's a criteria that's kind of important to us because we transport pediatric patients. So again, remember the criteria is that the kid is two years old. The day they turn two years old, they have to be in their own seat. If they're less than two years old, they can be held in a mother's lap or a father's lap or somebody's lap. Um, other things that are on the Part 91 uh, regs, uh, uh, every aircraft has a, P a PED, which is, uh, which is uh, an electronic device policy that basically says what things are uh, okay to be operated on that aircraft that are not part of the aircraft. So for instance, if you go and you look at your PED, you should see that all of your medical equipment is already on that PED list. So uh, your defibrillator and your pumps and your vent and all that stuff should already be on there. Um, and then the other thing is the Part 91 guidelines also say that the pilot, I'll say that again, the pilot is responsible for assuring that any loose equipment is appropriately secured for flight. So when a pilot says, I need you to secure blah, 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 blah better, uh, he has a legal right to do that. That's his, he's the one who's ultimately responsible for that. So we talked about Part 91, and the big thing you need to know about Part 91, again, we said that was the general aviation rules, and essentially, if we were going to make it really, really simple, we would say that a program is flying Part 91 when the pilot is not flying anybody for money. And I'll get back to that in just a second, because that's kind of confusing. The second uh, part that we need to focus on a lot in Air Medical is actually Part 135. Part 135 is what uh, is is the part of the Federal Aviation Regulations that's actually titled Air Taxi. And the big thing you need to remember when you think in terms of the FAA is remember the FAA does not consider or even think about the fact that we fly patients. They could care less. What we fly in their eyes is passengers. So if we fly a passenger for money then we are operating under Part 135. Now, Part 135 is much more restrictive than Part 91 because of the fact that the pilot is now flying uh, uh, civilians, if you will, and thus because he is also responsible for them, uh, the restrictions are much tighter. So, for example, if you look at weather minimums, like if you look at the Part 91 weather minimums, they say like basically uh, as a pilot you are responsible for flying the aircraft in a manner which is safe enough that you don't crash it uh, because of bad weather. That's about as about as defined as it gets. 
when you look at the Part 135 rules, they say that as a pilot you are responsible for assuring that this is in place and that is in place and this is in place and that is in place before you are going to accept a, a mission um, uh, with regard to weather. So there are very clearly defined uh, uh, things that have to be there in order for that pilot to be able to say, uh, yes, the weather is adequate for me to be able to fly. Uh, some other things uh, that are in the Part 135 uh, rules. Uh, in the Part 135 rules, it very clearly states that the pilot in command is ultimately responsible for the operation of the aircraft. And the other thing that actually is very clearly defined in the Part 135 certificate, is, or in the Part 135 regulations, is that no person may control that aircraft except for a pilot who is employed by the air medical program and is checked off in that aircraft. So uh, like if a pilot allows a crew member to fly the aircraft, like decides on the way home from a mission he's going to teach him how to fly, that's actually a violation of the law. Um, another thing that's real important that's in the Part 135 certificate or in the Part 135 rules and regulations is that all passengers have to be briefed if capable before they are put on the aircraft. So that briefing has to include things like emergency procedures, how to exit the aircraft, so on and so forth. And we also have to carry those passenger briefing cards with us for them to be able to read. So let's go back to this whole Part 91, Part 135 thing. So like when are we operating Part 91 and when are we operating Part 135? Well, we all know that if we have a patient on board, we're operating Part 135. That's simple enough. If you're XYZ program and you're flying a patient from point A to point B, are you flying Part 135 or are you flying, or are you flying Part 91? Well, we know because there's a patient on board, you're flying Part 135. The question becomes, what about when you don't have a patient on board, but you have a crew on board? So, for instance, when you're flying out to get a patient, let's say you're going from your base to Y Hospital, and you're going to pick up a patient at Y Hospital. So all that's on board right now is you as the pilot, uh, you as the nurse, and you as the medic. Those are the three people that are on board. So now are you flying Part 135 or are you flying Part 91? Well, the answer is it depends. Basically what it depends on is whether or not everybody is employed by the same agency. And so we'll pick on um, an employer uh, like a we'll pick on uh, Herman Hospital. Uh, phenomenal air medical program, been around a long, long time, very squared away program. And at Herman, the aircraft are owned by Herman Hospital, the pilots are employed by Herman Hospital, the maintenance is employed by Herman Hospital, the air medical crew members are employed by Herman Hospital. In that situation, because everybody on board is employed by the same uh, party, we would say that they are, they are legally flying Part 91. In other words, they, the pilot is not flying passengers for money because the uh, people that are on board the aircraft are employees of the same company. Now, in contrast, let's look just down the road at San Antonio Air Life. San Antonio Air Life, also a phenomenal air medical program, been around for lots and lots of years, very, very incredible program, but at their program, the way that it works is they actually have a vendor. Their vendor is uh, who, re who is responsible for providing the aircraft, the maintenance, and the pilots. The medical crew members and part of the program's financing actually come from a uh, conglomerate, I believe, of hospitals. Uh, I believe the employees are actually employees of the university health system. So in that situation, every single time they leave the pad, that pilot, by definition, is flying passengers for money. Even though on the outside, they may operate just like the people at Herman do, and what I mean by that is the crew members are engaged, they work with the pilots, they use good AMRAM, so on and so forth. From a legal perspective, because that pilot is flying people who work for another program, i.e. the hospital, they are always flying Part 135. The only way that that aircraft would not be flying Part 135 is if uh, the pilot was the only person on board. Now, just to make things muddier, and this is the whole reason why we have aviation attorneys, when you write your Part 135 op specs, as a program, you may choose to uh, write your specs in such a way that you always operate Part 135. And uh, a good example of this is, is where I work at. I work for PHI or Medical Group, and our policy at PHI is that we always fly Part 135. 
So it doesn't matter whether we've got a patient on board or not, we are always operating under Part 135 rules and regulations. And this is something that you as a crew member need to know. Because remember again, the restrictions are much tighter when you were flying Part 135 than you were flying Part 91. So when we talk about things like weather minimums and things like that, well it depends, are we flying Part 91 or flying Part 135? You have an obligation to yourself and to your family to know exactly where you're at, know exactly what the rules are, so you know exactly how much protection you do and do not have. Okay, uh, last but not least, when we're talking about aviation governance, it's not really part of aviation, uh, but it's worth mentioning here real quick. The other thing that really governs uh, a lot of the things that we do is the FCC. The FCC is the Federal Communications Commission, and they are responsible for managing all of the radio stuff and airwaves and all that good stuff. And one of the big things that really affects us with regard to the FCC is the FCC has very strict criteria about what can and can be used in the in the uh, uh, in the uh, realm of radio communications and telecommunications in an aircraft. And for example, they're the ones that say like that you're, we're not allowed to use a cell phone in a moving aircraft, or that we're not allowed to. Uh, uh, transmit certain types of data and things on, like that. So the FCC also plays a role as well in governance of, of uh, the things that we do in aviation. Okay, so why the emphasis on air medical crew safety? Well, here's the reality. When you look at the four pictures above me, those four uh, gentlemen are all uh, California Highway Patrol officers that died in the line of duty. In 1970, in April of 1970, there was an event called the Newhall Incident that occurred in, uh, in Southern California. Uh, these four officers were working two officers to a car, so there was two cars, and they were dispatched to a report of uh, two gentlemen that were driving down the road brandishing a gun at people. Well, in April of 1970, the standard was that when police officers made contact with somebody like that, they would do it just like they did uh, any other traffic stop. They would uh, put on their lights, they would pull in behind these guys. Uh, as soon as these guys pulled over, which they did, they would then exit their vehicle and they would walk right up to these guys. And what happened in Newhall in April 1970 is these two officers in the initial car were shot dead. Then two more officers responded to the call and did exactly the same thing and were also shot dead. So these two bad guys, if you will, in this car shot and killed these four police officers in a matter of minutes. Well, what in the world does this have to do with their medical? Well, the Newhall incident was a major turning point in law enforcement. Prior to April 1970, there was no real big emphasis in law enforcement on safety. I mean, it was there, but it wasn't really, we didn't really put a lot of emphasis on what we call now officer survival. Now, because of the Newhall incident, there, that was a catalytic event that made law enforcement trainers and law enforcement officers across the country wake up and say, this is freaking ridiculous. Police officers are dying because they're doing stupid things. They're doing things that are completely preventable over and over and over again. And because of that, people are dying. That one incident triggered a national response that completely changed the paradigm of law enforcement and the paradigm of officer safety. And having been a police officer after that, having come into law enforcement very early in the 21st century, or actually very late, I guess, at the, at the end of, of the 20th century, everything I did as a police officer was focused on safety. From my first day in the police academy, I was taught every single time you respond to a call, there is somebody there who is potentially going to try and kill you. And they create a mindset in police officers that, that focuses on safety. That all came because of the death of four police officers in April of 1970. Now here's the reality. When we look at the air medical industry, as of the date of this publication, uh, which is uh, the very beginning of 2009, we are walking around in bliss. We are walking around completely naive about the fact that our job is one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Uh, there is not the paradigm there like there is in law enforcement or even like there is in firefighting. There's not a uh, there's not an attitude in most people when they come to work every day that this is the day I could die. And because of that, we're making the same fatal mistakes over and over again. 
well, how dangerous is our job really? Well, here's what the statistics say, and this is all this all comes from the uh, Air Medical Physician Association uh, in uh, joint contract with uh, with uh, Johns Hopkins School of Epidemiology, where they did several studies that looked at air medical. Okay, so when we look at air medical fatalities, the reality is that for every hundred thousand people, there will be roughly a uh, hundred and uh, 196 fatalities. So every 100,000 air medical employees, there will be 196 that die per year. Okay, well, how does that compare to other things? Well, we all know the two biggest killers in the country are heart disease and cancer. Every year, those two, uh, those two rake up. So when we talk about heart disease, for every 100,000 people, there'll be 268 patients that die from heart disease in a given year. I'll say that again, for every 100,000 people in one year, 268 will die of heart disease. For every 100,000 people, 200 will die of cancer. 200 people will die of cancer in a given year uh, out, of a, out, of a, out of a bank of 100,000 people. Now let's go back and let's compare that to Air Medical. And with Air Medical, we said that it was 196. So uh, you've heard that joke before, like XYZ killed more people than cancer. Well, we are very close in it, as an industry to killing more people than cancer. We have a huge mortality rate. This is an extremely dangerous job, and it's something that we should have an attitude about when we go to work. We should go to work with the attitude that this is a job that very well could kill me if I don't do the things that I need to to protect myself. Now, how does it compare to other professions? Well, interestingly enough, if you look at the statistics from the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, they show that the most dangerous job in the country as of, as, of, as of 2005, that was the most recent data, was professional logging, so loggers basically. And the mortality rate for professional loggers was just under 100 per 100,000. So we in Air Medical have a uh, mortality rate that is over twice what the quote unquote most dangerous job in the U.S. is. Well, why aren't we counted as the most dangerous job? Well, it's really simple. Because the U.S. Department of Labor only compiles statistics on professions that employ more than, I believe it's 25,000 people. So the air medical industry is a relatively small industry. We don't meet that 25,000 mark, so they don't even compile data on us. But yet, when you look at the, uh, at the statistics that have been compiled by Johns Hopkins and by the American, uh, or excuse me, by the Air Medical Physicians Association, it's very clear that our job is an extremely dangerous one, 196 deaths per 100,000. Now, what does that translate to as far as a career? Well, it's pretty simple. According to the research that was done by Johns Hopkins, if you were to spend 20 years as an Air Medical crew member flying 20 hours a week, so you fly 20 hours a week for 20 years, in that 20 years, the chance that you would die because of an aircraft crash would be 40%. 40% chance that your cause of death would be an air medical crash. So uh, when we talk about the reality, this job is very, very dangerous. Now when we talk about where all of the fatalities occur, it's almost always the same. The number one reason why air medical assets crash is because of CFIT. CFIT is control flight into terrain. And when we talk about um, how we have progressed over the years, we've put a lot of attention on air medical safety in the last couple of years, but the reality of the situation is that 2008 was the worst year in our history. We had more deaths in 2008 than we've had in any year before. Now. When we think about that, it's really kind of scary because it demonstrates that the air medical industry meets the very definition of insanity. Uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same ridiculously wrong thing over and over again, and that's exactly what we do in air medical. So we need to really make some conscious decisions about changing how we practice in the environment that we practice in. One of the big ways that we've, uh, that we've utilized to try and make some changes is something called AMRAM. AMRAM is Air Medical Resource Management. And when we talk about Air Medical Resource Management, it's a focus on team communication. One of the biggest things that we need to do as an industry is we need to decentralize decision making. Decision making needs to be spread across the team. Uh, when we talk about uh, AMRAM, that's exactly what the focus is on. It's on how do we effectively communicate as a team and how do we make decisions as a team in order to have safer outcomes. The other thing that is really important about AMRAM is it emphasizes 
this whole complacency issue. When we go back and we look at police officers that are killed in the line of duty today, your average police officer killed in the line of duty is killed between seven years and ten years experience. It's not the guy that became a cop yesterday. Well, why is that? Because you get complacent. You get lazy. You get used to things going well. And that complacency is what kills. It's what kills firefighters, it's what kills police officers, and it is certainly what kills air medical providers. Uh, the other things that we emphasize in AMRAM, we also talk about distributing the cockpit workload. When you go back and you look at crashes, overwhelmingly what we see over and over again is that we get to a point where there is more data that is being thrown at a pilot than he has the ability to process. Uh, there's just too many things that are happening in too short a period of time. So if we can distribute that cockpit workload, if we can put all of our emphasis on the entire team focusing on flying the aircraft, then we relieve him of some of that responsibility. A good example is like your radio communications with your base. A lot of flight programs, the pilot does all the radio communications with the base. There are times when that has to occur, like when the crew is in the back, but like if you've got a crew member sitting up front, and that crew member is there where they have access to the radios and the GPS and all those other things, why would that not be done by one of the medical crew members? Why would you have a pilot do that? That's just one more thing that he's got to manage. And he's already got to manage 8 million things. I have all the respect in the world for our pilots because they have so many things to manage. Well, in AMRAM, we really focus on decreasing uh, his or her workload. And the other thing that's really important about the AMRAM concept is that it should be program-wide. It's not an aviation thing. It's not a cockpit thing. It's how do we improve communications in our dispatch? How do we improve communications uh, across the, the entire program? How do we improve communications with our customers so that we can get pieces of data from them like... Uh, uh, has anybody else turned this flight down because the weather's poor? Uh, or um, what are the, uh, the new obstacles around your helipad or things like that? It's got to be more than just a us in the cockpit kind of concept. Okay, now when we talk about uh, flight safety, keeping those things in mind, what are some things that we can do to improve flight safety? Well, one of the very first most important things that we can do is to, is to, is to closely abide by those rules of sterile cockpit. Remember, again, sterile cockpit, we said that doesn't mean sit down, shut up, and be quiet. What that means is that we put all of our emphasis on the safety of the aircraft when we were in a critical phase of flight. In other words, unless we are flying straight and level, then everybody's focus and everybody's attention should be on flying the aircraft. The other thing that we need to do as crew members is we need to make sure that our eyes are outside of the aircraft whenever uh, we have the ability to do so. And certainly when we're in a critical phase of flight, we had better have the ability to do so. Remember that getting the aircraft safely on and off the ground is much, much more important than taking care of your patient. You are a crew member first. You are a clinician second. The other thing that you should think about, remember that anytime you identify a hazard, it's your responsibility to tell the pilot. Uh, don't assume that he sees or she sees anything. You identify a hazard that's coming up, it's your responsibility to say, hey, do you got that tower? Hey, do you got that uh, building? So on and so forth. Uh, remember that everybody is responsible for the safety of flight. It's not the pilot's job in and of himself to get you safely from point A to point B. There's typically three people on that aircraft. Those three people all have the responsibility of getting the aircraft safely from point A to point B. Having said that, remember that the pilot is legally the one who is ultimately responsible. He is the one that everybody's going to come knocking on his door, including the FAA, when things go sick and wrong. So we we need to uh, we need to have a crew focused. Uh, a, a crew focused uh, mentality as to how we deal with things but you also have to remember that somebody has to ultimately be in charge and legally when it comes to operation of the aircraft that is the pilot. Now uh, some other things that uh, are important to remember remember that you should have your uh, seat belt on whenever we're in aviation operations uh, that are not just straight and level flight again and even in straight and level flight we'd prefer to have our seatbelt on but we certainly have to have our seatbelt on uh, whenever the aircraft is taking off, whenever the aircraft is landing, whenever it's taxiing or whenever the pilot in charge tells you. Remember that if the pilot in charge tells you to put on your seatbelt that is a legal order and you have a legal responsibility to uh, follow that order. Okay, now when we talk about flight safety, remember that the most dangerous operations occur at night. And when we talk about the two commonalities that we see in aircraft crashes over and over again, it's night operations and marginal weather. So as a crew member, I would implore you, not only do you need to know 
uh, your job, you very much need to know some small aspects of the pilot's job. And I'm not by any means saying that, that, that your job is to be a pilot. That's not what I'm saying at all. But you need to know what your weather minimums are. You need to know if you meet your weather, your weather minimums at any given point in your shift. That's your responsibility. Nobody else can be responsible for you but you. So you need to make sure that you understand those things. Now, um, and uh, when we talk about uh, uh, landing um, at an unsecured pad at night, remember that uh, the expectation is that if we're going to land on an unsecured pad at night, we need to have ground contact. It is acceptable uh, from a legal perspective and from a CAMES perspective, you may have a, 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 a department policy that's different, but from those two perspectives, it's acceptable to land on an unsecured LZ uh, during the day as long as you have good visualization and even though you don't have ground communications but at night it is never acceptable. We should never land at an unsecured uh, LZ at night um, and, unless we have uh, uh, ground contact which by definition would mean that it's a secured LZ. And the other thing is remember that if we're going to be landing on, an, on, a, on a scene at night on a secured uh, seen at night, ideally what we would like to see is that the landing zone is at least 100 feet by 100 feet. Remember that most of your errors that occur, uh, or, or a significant number of your errors that occur, occur on takeoff and landing. So we would like that extra space to be able to land and maneuver the aircraft around fairly decently. Okay, when we talk about weather issues, you do need to know a couple things about weather issues and weather minimums. The very first thing that you need to know is uh, the terminology that we use. Now, whenever we talk about weather minimums, that's the big thing that we're always focusing on, weather minimums are broken down into two parts. Uh, the, the first part is geographic, and the second part is, is whether it's day or night. So when we talk about geographic parts, we have two different types of weather minimums. We have what's called our local area and what's called cross country. Now, when we talk about the local area, what that means is that when a flight program writes their Part 135 certificate for the FAA, they define their local area. And so, for example, you can make your local area really simple and you can say, like, we're at XYZ Hospital, which is right here. So anywhere within a 30 nautical mile circle, that's our local area. You can do it like that or some places have more complex local areas like uh, everything to the west up to 10 miles, everything to the east up to 30 miles, everything to the north up to 15 miles, so on and so forth. But essentially you map out for the FAA what your local area is. And your local area, the idea behind that is that's the area that you normally operate in. And you're going to have a set of weather minimums that we call local weather minimums. Those are the minimums you have to meet to be able to operate inside that local area. Now, anytime you fly outside that local area, we call that cross-country flight. And there's a second set of weather minimums for cross-country. So first, let's look at our local minimums. When we look at our local minimums, we have a day minimum and we have a night minimum. So when we look at the day minimum, it's 501. Well, what does that mean? That means that in order for us to fly VFR, then what we would need to have is at least a 500 foot ceiling, so that means from the ground to the bottom of the clouds, there should be 500 feet, and we should have one mile of visibility. At night, we should have at least an 800 foot ceiling and at least two miles of visibility. So if we meet this and we're flying in the local area, then we would say that we were in BMC conditions, or visual meteorologic conditions. If we don't meet this, if the weather is poorer than this, then we would say we were in IMC conditions, which is instrument meteorologic conditions. Now, the one thing I do want to say as a caveat about these weather minimums here is these are the weather minimums that are guided by CAMES, uh, and, and, uh, and they may be very different than your weather minimums. If you work for a program uh, that has different weather minimums than this, that would not shock me. In fact, most of your progressive programs have gone to much more conservative weather minimums, requiring even more visibility and even a higher ceiling for both day and night and both local and cross country. So you may find your weather minimums are very different. These are the ones to remember for the exam. Okay, so we talked about the local weather min minimums. We said essentially if we were operating inside of our local area, we had to have at least 500 foot ceiling and at least one mile of visibility during the day, at least an 800 foot ceiling and at least two miles of visibility at night. 
Now, what if we're leaving our local area? Well, if we're leaving our local area and we're going cross country, then we have a second set of weather minimums. If we're going to go cross country during the day, we need to have at least a thousand foot ceiling and at least one mile of visibility. At night, you see that the ceiling stays a thousand feet, but we require three miles of visibility. And again, if we're going to be flying cross country, if we meet these criteria, then we're BMC, we're in visual meteorologic conditions. If we don't meet these criteria, then we are IMC, we are in instrument meteorologic conditions. Okay, so taking this all and putting this together. Remember we said if we meet those weather minimums, then we were in BMC conditions. Well, what is the advantage to being in BMC conditions? Well, when we're in BMC conditions, that allows us the ability to fly under visual flight rules. The visual flight rules are the rules that pilots use to fly essentially unaided. They're not flying on their instruments. They're able to fly based on their visualization. Now, if we did not meet those VMC conditions, then we were in what we said were IMC conditions. Well, what happens if we're in IMC conditions? Well, if we're in IMC conditions, then in order to operate the aircraft in those conditions, the pilot has to fly the aircraft under IFR rules or instrument flight rules. Now, instrument flight rules, the big thing you need to know about them is that they require operation of the aircraft under specific instruments and under specific technology and in order for an aircraft to fly IFR there have to be several things in place. The first thing is the Part 135 certificate needs to have an allowance for IFR operations. The aircraft has to be IFR capable and current. Um, all the maintenance on all the IFR stuff capable and current. Uh, the pilot has to be IFR rated and he has to be current in his IFR training. Uh, and so a lot of flight programs don't choose to do this purposely. They choose uh, because it's much cheaper, much more cost effective uh, to only operate under VFR conditions. Uh, so those pro programs would be VFR only. So in other words, when you get the call at 3 o'clock in the morning, can you take this flight and you're in IMC conditions, then the answer is just no because we don't operate IFR. But there are a lot of air medical programs as well that do operate IFR. And so for those programs, uh, they, they would be able to, uh, to accept that flight. The only, uh, the only stipulation is that they would have to fly under instrument flight rules. And there's several big things that are important about instrument flight rules. Like one of the things that's really important is you have to have two sources of places to land in case you can't get into one place. Uh, you have to have a backup LZ and that can be a real challenge in some of the rural parts of the U.S. And those two places to land have to be places that you actually have approaches into. Uh, so again, in rural parts of the U.S., that can be a really big challenge finding enough airports that have ILS approaches and things like that. So the IFR rules are, are a lot more specific. Now, the one last thing I do want to say is that you actually can fly IFR anytime you want as long as the pilot, the aircraft, the Part 135 certificate, blah, 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 is all accredited for that. Um, so we can choose to fly IFR on a clear, sunny day if we want to. The big thing to remember is that the only time we can fly VFR is in VMC conditions. So I'll say that again another way so that, uh, so that it's solid. We can fly VFR in VMC conditions only. We can fly IFR anytime we want. We can fly IFR in VMC conditions or in IMC conditions. Okay, when we talk about flight planning, when you accept a mission, some big things that you want to focus on. Uh, one of the things you want to do that's vitally important is you want to do an aircraft walk around. You want to walk around the aircraft and you want to do things like checking to make sure the doors are secure, make sure you don't have any seat belts or any straps that are hanging out, make sure all the tie downs and connections have been taken off of the aircraft, and make sure there's not any fluids under the aircraft that aren't supposed to be there, any uh, leaking uh, uh, oil or fuel or anything like that. Other things that we need to know as medical crew members, we also need to know what the oxygen capacity is and you should be able to calculate uh, based on your specific aircraft to know if you're going to have enough oxygen to make your mission or not. We also would like to know who our LZ contact is and again remember that if we're going to be landing at night we would prefer that our LZ is at least 100 feet by 100 feet. Hey, now what if we're flying along and we have an in-flight emergency? Well, there's various types of emergencies and you need to be familiar with the terminology for the three different types of uh, in-flight landings that, uh, or, or unscheduled landings that a pilot might have to make. The first type of flight emergency we could have would require something called a land immediately 
policy. So if a pilot is flying along and there are certain things that occur that require a land immediately policy, then the big thing you need to know is that the pilot has to do just that. The pilot has to land the aircraft right now, right where we are. And at this point, if a pilot is in a land immediately situation, basically what that means is that he, his whole focus and goal in life right now is on getting that aircraft onto the ground as quickly and as safely as possible in an effort to maximize survival for everybody on board. So when we have a land immediately situation, we have an honest to God life and death, uh, we've got to get on the ground right now or we're all going to die kind of thing. Uh, so a good example of land immediately situation would be like if you were in a single engine aircraft and it had an engine failure. Uh, you're going immediately into auto rotation, you're going to be on the ground in 10 or 15 seconds, good, bad, or ugly, you got to get on the ground right now. Now, the next level down, if you will, is something called land as soon as possible. There are certain things that, that certain maintenance issues that a pilot may have in flight that would require him to land as soon as possible. Now, what does land as soon as possible mean? Well, that means that the pilot needs to land the aircraft as soon as he can find a safe place to do so. So, for instance, with land immediately, we were like, good, bad, or ugly, we're landing right here, right now. With land as soon as possible, the pilot may be able to fly on for another minute or two or something like that to find like a, a big open field or, or, uh, or a, a big parking lot or, or some place that's a little more ideal to land. Uh, whereas, again, with the land immediately, we were just landing wherever we're landing. Finally, the last type of landing that you could have, the, the third level of, 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 of emergency procedure that we could have, is we could actually have something called uh, an, an issue where we have to do something called landing as soon as practical. Now, this is, this is a much more, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a much more uh, gradual, uh, much less severe emergency kind of situation. There are certain things that the pilot may recognize as maintenance issues that don't require him to land right now, right this very second. Uh, so don't, let, don't require him to land immediately. Don't require him to land at the very first safe place he can find to land, but require that he land um, as, soon as, he can, as soon as he can do so in an ideal situation. So for example, when we are in a land as soon as practical situation, that pilot may overfly uh, the parking lots and the grass fields because he knows that three minutes away there's an airport, so he can make it to that airport. So again, land immediately means we need to land right now, good, bad, or ugly, we're going down. Uh, land as soon as possible means that we need to land at the very first opening that we can find. Uh, and then finally, land as soon as practical really basically just means we need to land at the, at the closest airport we can find or the, or the closest helipad or, or someplace like that. So it's much more a convenience-based landing. Okay, now if your pilot comes up and tells you on your ICS that you're going to have one of these issues that, that uh, we, we're going to have to make an emergency landing, remember that we've got some priorities for things that we need to do. One of the first things we need to do is we need to get our patient laying flat. The other thing we need to do is we need to make sure that our patient is strapped in well. If you've got oxygen flowing to the patient, which we almost always have, you want to turn your oxygen off. The other thing that you want to do is you want to secure any loose equipment that you have laying around. Make sure that your seat belts are on. Make sure that your helmet visor is down, which it should be already. And then finally, you want to assume a crash position. And remember, when we talk about crash positions, there's two. The first crash position is the old lean forward, kiss your butt goodbye, wrap your arms around your legs position. And that's the position that we use if we've only got a lap belt. If we're in any seat that has more than a lap belt, or if we're in an aft-facing seat, the position that we use is we cross our arms across our chest, put our feet in front of us, and especially if you've got shoulder straps, hold onto your shoulder straps. So that is the uh, crash position that we would use in most of your newer aircraft that have, uh, that have chest harnesses as well. Now what if we actually have a crash? What do we do? Well, if you have a crash, remember that one of the things that you need to do right off the bat is you need to call for help. Your call for help should not come after the crash. Your call for help should come as soon as you recognize the fact that you're going to crash. And which frequency do you call for help on? Whichever one you're on. If you're on the fire department's frequency, if you're on your dispatch's frequency, if you're on the FAA frequency, whatever. If you identify that you're getting ready to go down, that should, that should generate an immediate mayday, 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 and then uh, your location as best you can as best you can provide. Now, once you get on the ground, one of the things that should happen is your emergency location 
uh, transmitter or your ELT should go off. That ELT is designed to transmit on the frequency 121.5 and it's just kind of a warbly kind of sound. That ELT will not go off though unless the aircraft typically sustains an impact that's at least 4 G's. So the takeaway point is if you're in a rural area and your ELT is not going off, which you would know by turning the aviation radio to 121.5 and listening for that sound, if it's not on, then you need to turn it on. Now, once you turn on your ELT, the other thing that you want to do is, uh, or uh, you may even try before you turn on your ELT, is you actually want to transmit again. Uh, make sure that everybody knows that you need help. Uh, remember that if you're going to use 121.5 to call for help, you need to turn off the ELT first because if you're trying to talk and the ELT is transmitting, then they're not going to hear anything. So you either call for help first and then turn on your ELT or turn on your ELT, wait a, wait a bit, and then turn it off and call for help. Uh, the other thing that you want to remember is that if the pilot is incapacitated, you need to know how to shut down the aircraft. And each aircraft has obviously a different way of shutting it down, but there are a couple of commonalities that we see across aircraft. Uh, almost all aircraft, almost all helicopters specifically, the first thing you need to do is you need to push your throttle down. Once your throttle is down, then the next thing that you need to do is you need to turn off your fuel, and the last thing you need to do is turn off the battery. Remember that you always want to turn off the fuel before you turn off the battery. Now, uh, some other things to think about, if you've been in a rotor crash, don't exit the aircraft until you make sure you know exactly where the upper blades are. Uh, remember that your helicopter is going to be much, much shorter than you remember it being because when you have an emergency landing, uh, skid spread, wheels get knocked out, all that good stuff, so you're basically probably going to be sitting on the shell of the aircraft. So uh, if you made the mistake and stepped out and stepped into the main rotor system, you would not be the first person in history to make that error after a crash. So we want to make sure that we check that rotor system first to make sure it's stopped. Uh, if it hasn't stopped, then we can use the rotor brake to stop it. And then the other thing is, uh, once you are safely out, then the focus becomes getting the rest of your crew out. So to get the rest of your crew out, uh, you want to uh, assist them as necessary. And remember that everybody should meet at the 12 o'clock position off the nose of the aircraft. Uh, this can be kind of confusing in a foresty situation uh, when you may not be able to see each other or if you're in water. Uh, so it's real important that everybody meets at the same place. So we always say aim for the nose. So we would like to go for the nose of the aircraft. Now, once you're, uh, once you're all secure and everything's safe, then the big focus is on getting the patient out. Um, we want to get the patient out, obviously, and then we want to assess everybody for injuries. We want to make extra calls for help. And then we need to start preparing for a survival situation. We should be prepared at any point in time to be able to survive up to 24 hours after an aircraft crash. Uh, based on what's in the aircraft and based on uh, our own survival skills. And if you're going to be in a situation like that, remember that you basically have uh, four or five priorities. Your first priority is always to secure shelter. Shelter becomes uh, comes before anything else. So we want to secure some source, source of shelter. We can use the aircraft if there's not a threat of it burning, but we want to secure some source of shelter. If it's cold, then our next source, uh, our next big priority is securing fire. We'd like to get a fire started uh, in order to keep us warm and also that we could potentially have to use that later uh, for other things like purifying water or things like that. Once we have shelter and fire, then we worry about water and food. Remember that uh, you can survive uh, several days without water. You can survive up to a week without food. So food and water are always low priorities. Our, our big focus is in a survival situation. Our shelter first, next fire, then finally we worry about water and food. And remember that water always takes precedence over food. So we want to secure uh, each one of those things uh, as we prepare for the fact that it may be some time before we get rec uh, rescued. Okay, when we talk about ground operations, just a couple quick things here about ground operations. Uh, when we talk about transport by ground, remember that one of the most dangerous aspects of ground transport is uh, uh, emergency operations of the vehicle. So when we're driving uh, Code 3 or lights and sirens or whatever you want to call it, that is one of the most dangerous things that we do. Uh, remember that when we make the decision to drive with our lights and sirens, that should be a conscious decision. And that conscious decision should be based on a clear uh, a, 
a clear piece of evidence that that is going to do something to change the patient's outcome. Just running code to run code is, is obviously not the smartest idea. And there's a lot of times when a lot of EMS systems run code for the most ridiculous reasons. Like for instance, if you have somebody who's in cardiac arrest, why in the world would you return a patient to a hospital in cardiac arrest running code three? They're dead. They're not going to, uh, the, the chances that they are going to miraculously survive are slim to none. And if they are going to survive, it's going to be because of the very same ACLS that you can provide that would be provided in the hospital. And really even, not even ACLS, just BLS. And so, um, so we really need to be cognizant about when we do and when we do not drive code three. Uh, the other thing that, uh, um, other things that we want to focus on. Remember, just like pilots, uh, when they uh, are, uh, when we see uh, uh, disasters in aircraft, a lot of times it's because pilots have been pushed into a point of uh, of overload, sensory overload, because the cockpit workload is too heavy. It's the exact same thing in the ground. That's why it's really important that when a driver is running code, that the driver is responsible for driving and nothing else. Uh, somebody else should work the radio. Somebody else should work the MDT. Uh, leave the driver free to drive. Uh, some other things to think about. Um, when you are running code, if you happen to be the driver of a vehicle that's running code, remember that the expectation is that you're going to use both your lights and sirens. And while state laws vary from state to state as to whether or not uh, they require that emergency vehicles use their lights and sirens, the reality is that in civil law, over and over again, it's been demonstrated that when uh, emergency vehicle operators are not using both their lights and their sirens, then almost always they end up uh, bearing the brunt of the suit and, 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 and losing uh, pretty horrifically. So even if the law says like you only have to use your lights or sirens, really the standard in the civil law arena is that in order to protect yourself, if you're involved in an accident while running code, you would really prefer that that accident occurred while you were using your lights and your sirens. Now one other thing to remember about lights and sirens, remember that lights and sirens are legally providing a request, a request for the right of way. Now this is a big gray area in the law because the law says that as a driver when an emergency vehicle comes up behind you running lights and sirens it's your responsibility to move out of the way. But the law also says that as a vehicle operator who is running with lights and sirens you bear the responsibility for assuring that it's done, excuse me, that it's done safely. So really both of you, if there's an accident and uh, it's because the other guy didn't pull over, but you were running lights and sirens. In the strictest sense, you're probably both going to be toast because you're both going to get blamed equally. Because the driver should have, the driver of the non-emergency vehicle should have pulled over to the side of the road, but didn't, so he's at fault. You, as the one who was running code, had a responsibility to make sure that you were doing it safely, so you were also at fault. So we want to make sure that, that uh, we are always cognizant of the fact that when we are running code, that is a request for the right of way. The other thing is you always have to think about giving people the, 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 because it's a request, you always have to give people the chance to, to meet your request. Nowadays with a lot of your newer cars, they have very limited ability to hear sound from the outside, especially when people have their car stereo on. A lot of times they don't hear lights and sirens till it's right up on them. So, uh, so we, uh, we want to give people that chance to respond to our request for the right of way and to move out of the way. Uh, that's really important, especially at places like intersections. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of states have laws that don't specifically mandate that you come to a complete stop when you come to an intersection when you're running code three, but yet your failure to do so and thus a result in striking of another vehicle is probably going to be held against you. Finally, um, we've already hit on this several times, but the big thing to remember again is remember that if you have an accident when you're running with your lights and sirens, the brunt of the responsibility is going to be on you until proven otherwise. So um, we want to be very cognizant of realizing that when we're running code, we are the one who's essentially responsible for everybody else's actions. So we want to be very careful and very diligent about the way that we run with our lights and sirens. And again, the best way to, to deal with these issues is when you have a patient who doesn't absolutely positively need lights and sirens, where we don't see that there's going to be a benefit uh, a measurable benefit from, from running this patient code, then we should just avoid it and not run code. Okay, well, I think that's all that we've got for today for uh, transport uh, and, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, transport environment and all the things and issues that come with that. 
Thank you for being with us. I appreciate you and I appreciate everything that you do. Feel free to e email me if you have any questions. My email address is abaca at camanagement.org. That's abaca at camanagement.org. Thanks and have a great day. I'd come for you, no one but you. Yes, I'd come for you, but only if you told me to. to.